Amen. Amen and amen. Um, Looking at chapter three, chapter three. Last week, we looked at the church of Sardis. And if you remember with the church of Sardis, this is the church that Jesus wrote to. And a part of him calling them out is Jesus told them, you all think you have it going on. Now, I don't know about you all, but just be honest. Have you ever have you ever, you know, um, got dressed up and to you, you know, you was looking good. You know what I'm saying? Your outfit was on fleet, shoes and everything fresh. And you just thought you had it going on only for somebody to call you out and let you know something that you didn't know. Like maybe you left the tag on the dress or, or something like that. Or, or just maybe they just say, hold on, you think you all that, but you ain't all that. And they just kind of do something to your feelings. But as we said before, when it comes to the Lord, he reserves the right to call us out. And if truth be told, many of us need to have that type of accountability in our life and our walk with the Lord. Well, when we know we're not lining up with God's will, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who will take the time to be honest with us and call us out. And that's what Jesus did to the church in Sardis. He called them out. He said, you have a reputation that you've developed among everybody in the community, that you all are alive and that you're thriving. But Jesus said, you think you're alive, but you're dead. Um, And I don't know about you all, but if I was there and a part of that congregation, when that letter was read, that's like a punch to the gut. But remember, whenever Jesus does something, he does it out of love, you all, right? Remember when the rich young ruler asked if, you know, what must he do to have eternal life? He ran up to Jesus, got down on his knees. Jesus told him what he needed to do. The rich young ruler said, I've done all of these things, you know, and, you know, so what else I need to do? And Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus loving him, looked at him and said, you're you're missing one thing. You're lacking one thing. And he told the young man that if he wants to have riches in heaven to go and sell his material possessions, the Bible said that the young man dropped his head and went away for he was very rich. But we have to be willing, you all, to accept the call out when the Lord calls things out of our life. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes a lot of us may not necessarily have a problem with God doing the calling out. It's when other people start doing the calling out. But watch this, you all. God works through people. God works through people. God will work through your wife or your husband to call something out, a deficiency in your character to help you. And we know that those of us who are married and, 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 and with our family members and close friends, the expectation is that when they tell us something, we know they're doing it out of love as opposed to other people sometimes who may not be doing it out of love. And so Jesus, everything he does, he does out of love. And he, he's calling out these churches. And today we're going to look at the last church because there are seven churches, the seven churches. This is the last church in the writing to the seven churches that Jesus addresses. And so we're going to look at Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 1. This is the church of Laodicea, Laodicea. And here's what Jesus said, because remember, John wrote down the revelation while he was on the island of Patmos that Jesus gave him. And John sent these letters to the seven churches that were there in the region of Asian Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And here's what he says. This is Jesus. He said unto the angel of the church and let us see right. Look at how Jesus describes himself. The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, the amen, the faithful and the true witness. Listen, you are. I'm so glad that we serve a God and we have a savior who is faithful and he's a true witness. And when you look at Jesus's life, who can bring an account against his level of faithfulness? Everything that he was required to do, that his father instructed him to do, he did it. He came down, I don't know about you all, but think about this. Jesus, a part of the triune Godhead, never a time where he existed outside of being in the realm that he was in, came down here to earth and wrapped himself in flesh, y'all. Just really try to get that in your mind that God came down here in flesh as a baby born into this world, right? Went through the physical development stages that many of us go through 
And at the right time, when his father told him, it's time to make it do what it do, Jesus was dispatched on the assignment that God had given him, and he was faithful even until the death of the cross. He's the true witness. When you look at his life and how he lived his life, it serves as a testimony. He's given these descriptions to the church, and he says the beginning of God's creation. Now, look at what Jesus does, you all. If you look at the other letters, and if you all notice, there's a pattern that we see in these letters. It typically opens up. Jesus will give a description of himself. After he gives that description, he would normally then come and commend the church. He would tell them the things that they are doing well. How many of you all like to be told, whether it's on your job or whether you have a spouse or just whether you're doing so? How many of you all like to be told that you're doing something, you're doing a good job? Raise your hand if you like to be told. And I told my, I think I told you this, I told my wife, I think I told y'all last week, I like when the diamond say, sweetie, you did a great job. That's like Scooby Snacks to me. You know what I'm saying? I just told her, girl, when you say that, I better mess around here and clean up this whole house in, in one hour. You know? <laughs> and I think she, she's seeing the power of that, y'all. I think she's trying to use me because she has been saying a lot lately, babe, I'm just so proud of you. And then she'll rub my little head and then I just go on off, do it. I come back and I'm like, what, what you need done now, sweetie? <laughs> but, but he commends them, right? And after he commends them and tells them the things that they're doing good, then we see he calls them out and he tells them the area that they need to address. But of all the churches, there's two churches where Jesus does not tell them they're doing anything good. He only give them no encouragement in terms of recognizing what they've done. And this is one of them. Look at what he says in verse 15. He says, I know your works. And we've already dealt with that. I know your works that it's very important that we understand that other people may not know our works and what we do, but God does. That's when we talk about that aspect of God character theologically where he's omniscient, meaning that God sees all and he knows all. Right. So we cannot hide anything from him. The churches need to know that what you are doing, God sees it. The churches need to know and the leadership needs to know that when you are taking and you are oppressing God's people, God sees it. For churches that are out here, that when people come in from different walks of life because they want to be loved on or they want to be encouraged and we don't handle with care the soul of these people and treat them with kindness and humility, God sees that and he knows that. Come on, somebody. Like we've been talking about in Bible study in James, God sees when churches play favorite, when, when, when churches play favorite and those who are the ones who give a lot and contributions we put them in the best seats or give them the attention and give them special treatment God sees that Jesus said I know your works I know what you are doing and and for some of us that ought to serve as an encouragement with how we live our life before the Lord to make sure that we're walking in the righteousness of Christ Jesus said I know your works then he says you are neither cold nor hot. Now, watch this, you all. Theologically or contextually, when Jesus makes this statement and the next statement, to really appreciate and understanding what he's getting at, you got to have some understanding of Laodicea and that region. Because Laodicea was in a region called the Lycus Valley, and they had two neighboring towns or cities that were close by them. You had Heropolis, which was about 11 miles, and then you had Colossae. Now, both of these towns, Heropolis and Colossae, because of where they were fixed at geographically, one was known for having hot springs, like you talking about jacuzzi. Listen, they ain't have to buy no jacuzzi because of where they were geographically located. They had hot springs that were there, and many people were aware of that, and that served as a tourist attraction. The other town had um, cold water that flowed down from the mountains, and they were able to use this as drinking water. Well, unfortunately, Lado Seal, because of where it was situated geographically, they had to build an aqueduct system where they had to pipe in water they literally had to pipe in water to come some six to eight miles away 
through the um, um, through their city in um, in pipes. And by the time the water would reach the city, it was lukewarm. So when Jesus tells them you are neither cold or hot, would that you were either cold or hot. He said, listen, I wish you were either hot or cold, because at least that way I, 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 I can distinguish the difference. And then look at what he says in the next verse. He says, so because you are lukewarm, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will what? Spit you out of my mouth. Now, understand this, you all. In this context, when he's saying hot or cold, it's not that one is better than the other. They're both good in this context. But what he's saying is you all are lukewarm, you're in between, and what he's getting at, he's not talking to them about the resource of water. He's using an illustration to talk about their spiritual condition. He's trying to tell them, as a congregation, as a community of faith, you all are not where you need to be. And as a result of your lack of effectiveness and your witness and you compromising, he said, I really feel sick to my stomach in so much that I want to spit you out of my mouth. Let's finish reading this. And he says, for you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, wretched, he didn't say ratchet, wretched, pitiful, poor, <laughs> and naked, leave it right there. <laughs> when I read that at first, I said, Lord, did you just say ratchet? That's a, that's a new, no, it's wretched. What he does, you all, is remember, God's assessment of the church and of our life is going to always be accurate. It's going to always be on point. You don't have to worry about God missing anything. Now, sometimes when we assess something, we can miss something, right? I work with an agency, and many of you all are familiar. I work with the Division of Family and Children's Services, and I'm what is called regional staff. And so I'm a part of a team where we provide guidance and leadership to three different counties in the state of Georgia in the metro Atlanta area. Well, one of the areas that I've been trained in is the ability to assess for safety, right? When I was a case manager and through my training, I would go in the house and through and ask and interview questions. My job was to assess before I leave this house, are the children in this home safe? And if they were safe, then we were cool. But if they were not, then there's some things that we would have to do to mitigate those safety concerns. Now, there were times even when I was a young case manager and when I even became seasoned where sometimes I would go and complete an assessment and I forgot something and I had to call the caretaker and say, hey, I apologize when I was there. I forgot to ask this question. Can do you mind? Do you have about five minutes? And I would have to ask them that question and they would say, yeah, we don't have any problem. The point that I'm making is that a lot of times when we assess something because of who we are and our frailties, we can easily overlook something or we can miss something. There have been times when people have made legitimate mistakes trying to complete an assessment. There have been times when the doctors had to call somebody back and say, you know what, we, I apologize. We told you something that was not right. We're looking at these, you know, looking at the x-rays and we're looking at the MRI. We're looking at the CAT scan that we did. Can you come back in? We need to have another discussion because we're humans and we make mistakes, but not God. Because when God says something, you can take it to the bank because his assessment is on time. And so God tells them, he says, listen, y'all need to get it right. This is your wake up call. You have people in the community where you all live at that need you. They need you and you're losing your witness. And what I'm saying to us today as the body of Christ and as the church collectively, we are losing our witness with the world. And one of the main reasons that we're losing our witness with the world is because the church feels like we have to adopt some of the cultural practices in order to be relevant to reach the people in the world. And there's no Bible passage of scripture that says that we have to embrace certain aspects of the culture that stand in opposition to the character of God in an effort to reach the people. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the one that's doing the drawing and using and doing the reading. Now, I understand that when it comes to 
engaging people and things of that nature. Yeah, there are certain things and strategies and, wh- and things that you want to be able to try to do or that may increase certain opportunities. But all in all, you want to know how to reach people? Do you really want to know how to be effective with people? Be honest and loving with people. Because that's what many of our churches are missing today. Do a survey and ask most people why they leave church and don't come back. And you know what you'll discover? They'll talk about how I came. Somebody said something to me. They were rude to me. Or I didn't feel like they cared. I didn't get a call or any of these things. Right. People want to come to a place where they feel like they are accepted, where they are a part of community. Listen, and if they feel that their family or their children are getting some of those same aspects of being poured into and they feel like they're a part of community, parents will stay at a church that may be lacking in certain areas if they know that their children are growing. But again, we have to make sure as the people of God and as the house of God that we're not doing what these churches in Revelation were doing. And it's so easy for us as churches to do it, to compromise according to the culture. The Bible teaches us, right, that we ought to stand in contrast to the world in the sense that we are different. We serve as light barriers to the world. Watch this. I don't have to help me, Holy Ghost. Some of y'all may walk out when I say this, but I'm just trying to be real. I don't have to go to a strip club in order to minister to people where that has become a stronghold in their life. I don't have to use drugs in order to be able to identify and minister to somebody. Guess what I can do? I can have a heart of understanding and love to be able to help them understand you know what i can understand why you feel the way you feel but god doesn't want you to remain in that position when the bible says and paul says i become all things to all people that i may gain them paul is saying listen i know how to relate to people and many of us We act like we don't know how to relate to people. Now, I know I ain't talking about nobody up in here, but a lot of people in the church, we get so disconnected from the world and from the community that we act like we forget where we came from. Come on, somebody. You know you used to listen to 8-Ball and MJG coming out hard. Come on now. You know you know the whole movie to Boys in the Hood, Minister to Society. Why are you going to sit here and act like you don't know what time it is? You know what the club scene looked like. And that's what many of us to do. We, we, we try to act and we put on this front as if we never were out there in the world. And people who are in the world and going through, they can look at us and see that we're not authentic. But when you just be who you are and be authentic, that's why you are. I try my best to be authentic. I don't try to put on a mask and be somebody who I'm not. I try to be who I am in Christ Jesus with my faults and my frailties, and I allow God to work in me and through me to still try to have an impact on other people. This church had gotten to the point where Jesus said, you all have missed the mark. And look at what he says. See, here's Jesus' assessment. He said, for you say, this is what you think about yourself. See, when a person is a narcissistic and a person is arrogant, listen to what they say about themselves. They're not going to say anything negative about themselves. They can see the fault in everybody else, but they can't see no. Have y'all ever met anybody like that? Like they literally can tell you everything about yourself. And then you back up and say, okay, well, what are some areas in your life you need to work on? And they literally say, you know what? I really don't have anything I need to work on. That's a person who's a, that's a clue. Because everybody ought to have some area. Listen, y'all, we'll be here all day if I started telling you. You'll probably be like, well, Pastor, that ain't really something you need to work on. Well, that's something that the Lord showed me in my heart that I need to work on. He said, you say I am rich. Because watch this, you all. The city of Laodicea was known for being one of the most wealthy cities in that region. In fact, right after Ephesus, it was the second wealthiest city 
in that region. In fact, they were so wealthy that in A.D. 60, an earthquake struck that town and damaged and devastated it, many of their beautiful structures. And when Rome stepped in and said, hey, we can provide you all with some FEMA, with some support to help you all, they said, no, nah, we good. We don't need y'all help. They rebuilt their city without the help from the government because they were sitting on money like that. They were known for having the best libraries. In fact, they had one of the best medical schools that people came from all over to go to. And they were known particularly for two commodities that everybody tried to get there for, for a dye that people would use to dye wool or use for a color dye. And they were also known for eye salve that would be used to help with the eye. So because this was a city that was very wealthy, understand that impacted the community of faith and the believers who lived there. He said, for you say I'm rich. You all think y'all got it going on. I have prospered and I need nothing. And watch this, you all. This is the position that a lot of people take when it comes to God. I'm rich. I'm prosperous. I really don't, I don't need anything. And see, that's what the enemy wants people to think, that you can live this life without God and you don't need any help at all. And that's one of the biggest deceptions that we can operate in because Jesus comes back and says, you say these things not realizing what your true condition is. See, if you really want to know, like I said, you all, if you really want to know what people think about you and your character, ask some people who are going to tell you the truth. Ask some people who will tell you the truth. In fact, they have this leadership survey called a 360 where the, the survey calls for you to tap into reaching out to some of your closest friends to give them this survey to fill out about you. The reason they call it 360, because watch this, y'all. There's some things that you think you know about yourself that you really don't know that other people see or see differently. And you're trying to get what your closest friend's perspective, what their, co their perspective is of you, because you want to be able to work on those areas where you have a deficiency. And so I'm going to just tell on myself, you all, an area of weakness that I had, and it has gotten much stronger, is that by nature and what I noticed for the better part of my life, and I promise y'all I'm not pumping myself up, I, I'm kind of a nice guy, all right? I'm kind of a nice guy. Some of y'all may say, you know what, Pastor, you are a pretty nice guy. And sometimes, and because of how my personality is a lot of times, if I need to tell somebody something that might hurt their feelings, I kind of struggle with that, and I'll try to find all the words to string together, and sometimes I'll hold out and I don't want to say anything because I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm just, can I just tell on myself? I'm just being honest. All right, you all? And that's just how, that's how I am. But because I know that's an area of weakness that I need to improve on, the Lord has helped me become better. I'm not where I need to be, but I'm much better than what I, where I used to be. The point that I'm making is that's an area that my wife and a, another close friend of mine revealed to me. He said, Key, real, he said, Key, you just a real, this was years ago. He said, Key, well, you just a really, and then he's, a, <laughs> he's a pastor, he's from New York, but he live in Atlanta. And he just told me when we was in seminary, he said, you know what, Key, Wan? He said, doggone it, you just a really nice guy, man. He said, what I'm telling you, if you're going to pastor, you got to understand. And he could tell me, so you got to understand these Negroes will take you here and take you there. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. I gave, I gave the PG-13 version. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but, but the point that I'm making with this is, you all, is it's easy for us to say things are well and they're not. It's easy for a married couple to masquerade and make people think that everything in my marriage is, is well when it's not. That everything at home is well when it's not. And that's why sometimes it shocks many of us, right, for people who we know or you, you get a headline or something come out or somebody tell you so-and-so um, them broke up or they about to get a divorce or uh, you hear something news and you're like, man, wow. Well, the reason it shocks many of us is because what they have been presenting themselves to be 
that was really a facade and that wasn't what was really going on. So Jesus said, you say these things about yourself. He said, but let me tell you what your actual spiritual condition is. He said, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you think you're rich, but you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Now, we know that these are not terms where he's talking about, about them physically because physically they're not poor because they're rich. These are words that he's using to describe their spiritual condition, you all. And you all, I'm going to tell you all like this. I don't know about you all, but my heart has been really heavy these past years when I look at the spiritual condition as a hold of this country, and when I step back and I look at the community of faith as a whole, and I ask myself, are we doing what the Lord has called and commissioned us to do to truly have an impact on this world? And that's why I've shared with you all, I want us, I want Out of Love Ministries to be a church that's not a perfect church because you're not going to find any. But I just feel you all that if we keep the main thing, the main thing, that when people come here, regardless of their walk of life, when we're able to love on them, come on somebody, and we're able to show them the love of Christ and help disciple them. That's what the church is missing today. This is why you got a lot of these teachers out here in these churches and in these large churches teaching false teaching that is not even biblical, standing up and preaching sermons where they're not even using the Bible. They're giving their opinion on what they think. This is why when you challenge them on what they say, they can't use scripture to support their position. We're supposed to be people who are following what the Lord has called us in his word and looking and seeking to help disciple people so we can look more like Jesus and our thought, our attitude, and our behaviors. But for this church, Jesus said, you all have missed it. He said, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you are naked. This is the call out, but look at what he says. He says, I counsel you. Because remember, he's the, he's the great counselor. Why? He, he, he is wisdom. He said, listen, you all are in this predicament, and like I told you all before, out of all the churches, this church got the most scathing rebuke out of all of the seven churches. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Remember, he's not talking about money. He's basically telling them, you all need to come back to me. Find your way back to me. Check your heart. Remember, our sermon series is entitled, Check Yourself. Check your heart so that you may be rich. And here it is again. We see the same thing that we saw, I believe, in Sardis. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve, here we go again, and salve um, to anoint your eyes so that you may see. All terms, you all, where he's talking about their spiritual condition. In essence, Jesus is saying to, to the church and he's saying to us, he's saying, listen, as you remain in this world, you got to stay separated from the world. Do not compromise. And you got a lot of churches, you all, who are doing this. They're compromising for the sake of popularity, for the sake of Everybody wanting to come there. But watch this. The Bible says, whosoever will, let them come. We got to tell people the truth. We got to tell people, and the truth is this. As the song says, if your life is not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. God is not looking for perfect people because he knows they're not, they're not perfect. But what he is looking for is people who are sold out for him. See, Jesus called this church out. You ain't sold out enough. You need to get back. Go back to the drawing board. In sports, every good coach knows that when you go into a game, you got to have a game plan. And for those who watch football, last week we see that there were some questionable things that many people and sports commentators bring up with the football games that happened last week, particularly when you look at the Baltimore Ravens and they played against the Kansas City Chiefs. 
The Baltimore Ravens, all season long, they have been giving other teams the business. Many people was like, man, they about to take, they about to take Kansas City up. But they end up doing something that nobody expected they would do, and they changed up their game plan. Why would you get to the game and change up what's worked for you? You got a quarterback who's running a 4-4-40. When he dropped back in the pocket, he's just sitting up for five or six or seven seconds scared to run. He needs to use his God-given ability and get out of that pocket and run. And so, again, any good coach knows if something does not work that we tried to make work going into this game, we got to go back to the drawing board. That's why any good coach knows I have to make adjustments, and those adjustments a lot of times is made at halftime. And these teams come out, and they're a completely different team. We see that last week when the San Francisco 49ers played Detroit. Man, Detroit Lions was giving them the business, you all. You had people who went on Facebook, man, yeah, we got this, Detroit all day. And then you heard the crickets when the game was over with. <laughs> because the second half came, and the 49ers made some adjustments. And Detroit stopped doing some of the things that worked. What are you trying to say, Kiwan? What I'm trying to say is go back to the things that you did that work. Go back to being kind and compassionate. You know why? Because, because that works, you all. I, I've just learned over the years that if you, for the most part, treat people with respect, it's amazing. It is amazing the reaction and the response that you can get from people when you just treat them with respect. I've seen it, you all. I've seen it with the job and occupation that I'm in where clients were irate and upset. And then I stepped in and start talking to them. And because I treated them with respect, come on, somebody, I was able to get what I needed from them. Sometimes what hurts many of us in our witness and what hurts the church is how we talk to people and how we treat people. Let me tell you something, people in general, and let me tell you from a man's perspective, when people, and especially from a man's perspective, when you disrespect people, and especially a man, it's going to be real challenging for you to get back in their good graces. Because as men, that's one of the things that we hold in high regard is respect. And if you want to see people respond to the church in a more positive way, then we need to start treating people with the love of Christ and giving people the same respect and dignity that we see that Jesus gave people when we look in the word. Jesus said, those whom I love, and this is the thing that many of us need to understand as children of God. God is our father. And you think about those of you all who have children. I don't know any parent, and I'm not trying to be funny, unless there's something psychologically wrong with them. I don't know any parent that likes to discipline their children, right? That's not something you like to do. You get some people that maybe like to do it, but I don't like to discipline my children. You know, I didn't like telling KJ, little man, you can't play the game because I know how hard he works during the week. So that kind of did something to me. And then we was in the kitchen and a dad... <laughs> We was in the kitchen and the dama said to me, <laughs> she said, sweetie, this was yesterday. She said, sweetie, where's KJ? I said, he downstairs. And then the follow-up question, Brother Frank, she was like, what he doing? I was hoping she didn't ask what he was doing. You know? She said, what he doing? I said, he's in um, the computer room. Doing what? <laughs> I made a walk down. The, I said, he's playing his computer. She go look at me and give me them eyes. Because mm -hmm. she be getting on me, y'all. She was like, yeah, you be going back on your word? I said, baby, listen. I said, I, he didn't play on Friday, babe, okay? I said, let the man, I said, he ain't messing with nobody. I said, he done did his project and everything. I said, I'm going to work with him tomorrow so he can get the, the rough draft done. He done typed out everything, but she just gave me that look. Mm -hmm. but, but as parents, no parent wants to discipline their child, but we know that discipline when done right serves as a deterrence to our children. Think about the things that happened to you when you were young, right? I remember when I was younger, you all, I went into the mall with some friends. When we lived in Tampa, Florida, I was probably about eight or nine years old. And um, 
I saw these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures that I really wanted. And I told my friends, I said, listen, I helped y'all get y'all Nintendo game. I need y'all to help me get these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because, you know, back in the day, them turtles was hot as fish grease. And so they told me, they said, man, nah, we ain't coming with you. So I was bold, Sister Don. I said, I'll go to the mall by myself. Walked on up to the mall, went into this store, you know, green behind the ears. Think I, you know, think I had it going on and, you know, took them Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle toys and, you know, put them in my pocket and, you know, start walking to the exit. And then, you know, I felt a hand reach out and grab me. That hand was like, hey, you, get over here. I was like, oh, like the Matrix. And the man was like, um, excuse me, sir, where are you going? I said, I'm getting ready to leave. He said, what's in your pocket? I said, I don't know what you're talking about, but you need to let me go. And I tried to leave. <laughs> and he said, you ain't going nowhere. And they, uh, <laughs> that's what they did, though, Ms. Dom, I'm telling you. And, you know, they forcefully, you know, checked my pockets. Then they took me back in the room. And all, all the time, you all, I don't even care what they're going to do to me. What you think I'm thinking about? My mama. Destination unknown. Went out on her own. She was barely even grown and became my mama. I barely knew my dad. I started quoting the CeeLo lyrics. You know what I'm saying? I was like, my mama, for so long, she had to be strong. I know at certain times she'd be wrong, but she's still my mama. I'm thinking about my mama. And I get back there, and they call my mama, sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> and my mama came. And by God's grace, they didn't arrest me or file any charges, and my mom was so disappointed. And uh, we went home, and she, she told me, I don't know about y'all, but you know, sometimes your parents will tell you how they're going to get you. And she said she was going to get me, Sister Tashina, but you know, one day passed, and she didn't get me. Two days passed, deep, and she didn't get me. By day five, I was scot-free. I said, well, maybe it just slipped on my mind. You know, she worked so hard. But let me tell you something. Boy, when we hit like day six or seven, I was in that room. And my mama kicked that door in. And she said, drop him like it's hot. <laughs> and when I tell you, she told me up good. Now, watch this, you all. My mama... My mama did me so good when I was about eight years old. She did me so good, you all. There was only one other time in my life, and I was 15, when I ended up taking something else out of the store, and that was only one time. And I told my friend, I said, listen, bro, I had an experience that happened some years ago that I'm not trying to happen again, so I ain't about this life, right? <laughs> so we know as parents, discipline when done right it can help save your child. Some of you all right now know you wouldn't be where you are today if you didn't have parents or you didn't have relatives or somebody who served as some type of a father or mother figure in your life to help discipline you. And so what I'm saying is that when it comes to God, Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. That is an expression of God's love. When we are out of alignment, God says, there's some things I have to do to bring you back into alignment. And whatever God has to reach down and touch in our life to ruffle the feathers, God will be willing to do it. There's some people right now, you all, they don't even understand this. But do you not know there are certain things that God can touch? in your life to get your attention. For some people, God can touch your finances. You got people say all of a sudden, man, dang, I ain't never had no problems with my car. Dang, you know, in four months, I done tired them, went out, doggone radiator, all these things. And you will just try to start chalking up and say, well, it just must, no. It could be God because there's nothing outside of his control that he can't put his hands on. Some people are going to the doctor where they have things that's going on in their body and the doctor saying, listen, we can't find anything medically wrong with you. We don't know why you having these back pains. And then they'll start doing assessments asking you, well, are you stressed out? What's going on? And, and for many of us, we don't even understand. God done reached down and touched our health. God can do some things to discipline us, to get our attention, watch this, in an effort to shake us up spiritually so we'll come back to being in alignment with him. And that's why it's good that we always should evaluate our life, spiritually speaking, to ask ourselves, the life that I'm living, is it pleasing to God? The life I'm living, and be honest with yourself, and if you need somebody to help you, ask somebody who you know 
that's going to be who going to keep it 100 with you because we want to make sure we're living a life that's pleasing to God. He said, so be zealous and repent, because remember you all with these churches that he's calling, he's telling them, yes, y'all got these things going on. Yes, you walked away from me. But he said, you know what you can do? You can make it right. All you got to do is repent. And as we said before, repentance is not just saying, God, forgive me. Then we go out and do the, the same thing. True biblical repentance is when we have God lay sorrow and we are remorseful for the thing or the things that we have done. And we turn away from those things and we turn back to God. That's what God is looking for so that the church can regain its witness in this world world because you all each second each minute each day each year things are changing and you all I don't know about you all but sometimes I think as a parent I say I'm 42 I say Lord how is this world going to look 20 years from now when I have grandchildren and my children have their own families and that's why we have to make sure that we are where we need to be in Christ, Jesus. Jesus closes out. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And when you look at this in the Greek, knock denotes a continual action. He said, I'm standing at the door and I'm going to keep on knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's, this, is, this is intimacy right here, you all. He's saying that if you open up the door of your heart, I will come in. But notice, notice he didn't say, I'm going to kick down the door and come in. He said, I'm going to knock on the door. And see, some of us, God had to do some things to get our attention. And you heard the Lord knocking at your door. Some of us right now, we hear God knocking at our door. But for various reasons, we don't want to get up and answer the door. For some people, they don't want to answer the door because they know that if they answer that door, they're going to be called to live a life where they have to sacrifice. And what I've learned over the years, a lot of people have a problem walking with God because they know it's going to cost them something. And let me tell you this, anything in life that's truly worth having, it's going to cost you some things. If you want to have a healthy marriage, it's going to cost you some things. If you want to raise children in a good environment, in a godly environment, it's going to cost you some things. If you want to have some things in life that you want to set yourself up financially, it's going to cost you some sacrifices that you have to make. Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. But you got to willing, be willing to open the door. Are you willing to open the door? You all, I thank God that when he came knocking in 1999, that I opened the door. And I always tell everybody, I've been walking with the Lord since I was 17 years old. And there's a lot of mistakes that I've made. There's a lot of discipline <laughs> that the Lord had to do um, with me. But I can tell you, this that God is faithful and I've had some ups and I had some downs but I tell you my ups far outweigh the downs that I've experienced and there's nothing I would do to change how things have happened in my life even the things that are painful and the things are hurtful because I know that the Lord is is with me and he's carrying me and he's not just carrying me you all he's carrying you if you open the door and you've trusted in the lord with all your heart he is carrying you he said the one who conquers i will grant him to sit with me on the throne as also conquer as i also conquer and sit down with my father on his throne He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, whenever Jesus says this, he who has an ear, he's not talking about a physical ear. He's talking about spiritually. Because, see, there's a lot of times people's spiritual ears have become clogged up with the earwax of this world. As if you know anything about earwax, if your body produces more earwax than it's supposed to, it can hinder your ability to hear. In this world that we live in, there's so many different things that we deal with on a daily basis that clogs up our spiritual 
ear. The Lord knows this. This is why we have to repent. This is why we have to always make sure we write with the Lord so that we can hear what the Spirit of God is saying. As we bow our heads right now, I ask you all, what is the Spirit of God saying to you? What is the Spirit of God saying to you?